Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Long Story Short podcast. Uh, my name is Colin Smith. I'll be your host. Um, I'm joined today by Brett Cheek, Hello. a teaching and spiritual formation pastor, and Kim Holman, a discipleship director here at LaCroix. And uh, we are going through a series called Long Story Short, which this podcast is a, a companion to that. And during this series, we are looking at the whole of scripture and breaking it down into six different parts. We have creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, church, and new creation. i am got it now, y'all. You got it. Got it. <laughs> mm, okay. Um, and what this podcast is really is just a chance for us to look at each of those different sections um, and take a deeper dive because a 30-minute sermon just doesn't do it justice. You know, we, we want to learn more and, and like I said, dive deeper about each of those things. And so um, today we are actually in part two mm-hmm. of the church and we're going to be specifically talking about church as a movement. But as we've done before, Brett, if you wouldn't mind just yeah. kind of giving us another quick recap of, of yeah. where we're at. So creation, a good God makes a good world and a good humanity to bear his image in the world and to continue his mission. Um, in it fall, we reject that mission and, uh, want to be in control of our own lives. Um, and everything fractures because of that. And we are born in sin. Um, we are living with it. We choose it on a regular basis. Our relationships with each other and with creation and with God are broken. And God starts his rescue plan to redeem everything because that's in his nature. And this mission that he is on continues now in a new way through healing creation. And he starts by calling himself um, to calling to himself a people that he grows into the people of Israel that are to be on mission to redeem all the nations. Um, And it's in that space, even through their dysfunction, like in drama and um, all of the craziness that happens, Um, it's into that context that he steps into the story himself. He writes himself into the story, um, as a human in Jesus Mm. and brings about redemption, pays for our sin, offers us a new way back to God and a way of life together. And then we come to the church where Jesus kicks off the church. He, he gives the Holy spirit and the spirit of God into the church. And last week we talked about how we made a um, really a false separation mm. between church as community and church as movement because they have to be together. Right. Yeah. Those two have to play together. We'll talk about more why in a minute. But um, last week we focused on the community side of the coin of the church and how that was crucial to the church's mission is that it had a, a unique kind of community that was, it was living out um, together. And, um, and so we're talking about church as movement today. And um, one of the reasons I invited uh, Kim is she's um, not only a pastor on staff here, but um, recently did some um, doctoral work um, around Mm -hmm. some of this stuff. And so I wanted to have her come. We could pick her brain a little bit. But I'm not an expert. (laughs) (laughs) You're the most expert person at this table. You're more of an expert than I. So, yeah. Oh my goodness. You know, Brett, it, it blows my mind that each time you do that, it's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. And and kudos to you. Yeah, for that. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Not he easy. left out Abraham, and he just yeah. said the nation. Yeah, he's just called the nation. He's just really himself. good at this. He, really good at this. Yeah, you are good at this. Oh, thanks. So as <laughs> as we mentioned, you know, we talked last time about church as community, mm-hmm. but it wasn't meant just to stay insular right. and in in one place. The whole idea is that this would be spread to all the nations. That's right. And this way of Jesus would be taught to everyone. Yeah. And, and the community and the mission of the church are born together. Mm-hmm. It's not one happens and then the other one happens. They come wholesale together. It's in community that the Holy Spirit falls. And the thing that happens is that the nations are reached. Yeah. On that very first day. On that very yeah. first day. Mm-hmm. And then and then it you know, it flips to they were together and, and uh, they shared everything in common and um, that wonderful passage in Acts 2. Uh, and, and then it, and it ends with, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So these are, they are not separable. 
um, even if they are two sides of the same um, of the same concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it could be. Um, there are things that um, we have in culture today that um, say, "Hey, come see this thing." Yeah. And I guess it could have it could have been that God could have set it up that way. That here's this thing; it's happening in Jerusalem and only in Jerusalem. Come now and follow this way of Jesus. <laughs> right. Um, but but he chose he chose not to do that. Yeah. Well, and it starts. They they do start by reaching the community that they're in, mm-hmm. um, and it kind of it sort of spreads from there. Yeah, and sometimes it spread beca- out of their own control. So if there yeah. was persecution and everybody scattered, well, then all these people went to different places and, right. you know, the message of Jesus was spread there, not by their choice. Right. right. So Yeah, it's one of the first, the first missionary movement of the church mm-hmm. is because of the persecution that breaks out against, against the church. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, and just like God does, um, He always finds a way for His mission to redeem the world to be woven into into everything that that happens. And so the church's is movement um, is absolutely in our DNA. One of the quotes that I, I think I'll use in the sermon when I get to preach on this, um, I can't remember the exact quote, but it was it's something to the effect of. Um, it is sometimes hard to turn a family into an army. But people that are in the army together become family. Hmm. And, um, and there's, it's something to that effect. Mm-hmm. And if you only do the community part that we were talking about last week, Kim, I think you ended talking about, what was the word? Incurvasse. Incurvasse. Yeah. <laughs> that there's this inward turn that can happen and often happens when a church forgets the movement yeah. side yeah. and they focus on family and deep relationships and community, which is beautiful. But we remember that when Jesus called the disciples, it was follow me. He was, yeah. when, when they did life together, it was on mission. Mm-hmm. They did mm-hmm. life together in the context of being on, on mission, mission with one mm-hmm. another. Yeah. And when people are on mission together, often they become family. Like you think about like every sports movie that's ever made, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the plot's that's always true. the same, yeah. you know, it's people that don't get along yeah. and it's dysfunctional and they have a new coach that they don't like. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, and it's in the process of being on a mission together that this community is born, which is always a little, you know, contrived that that can happen in 93 minutes or whatever. Yeah. Um, but why, why does that speak to us? It's because people that are, that are on mission together, that's, that's maybe one of the best places for community to become real. Yeah, because you share the hardships and you share the joys and you share the puzzles and how to solve, how to get through things. And yeah, yeah. so you become closer that way. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's interesting to me how it is and it isn't um, that when the church faces that initial persecution that is the harbinger of the gospel spreading from there right and so i I just think about it in our in our context and i think so often and you know this this connects to um our lives in jesus but i think it connects to a a number of different things too whether it's um calling or our vocation or Mm -hmm. um leading a family or, or whatever it is is um when we face trials or persecution, we think that that's a negative, bad thing. There must be something wrong with me or with God. But what, but it, that doesn't seem to be uh, the case with this early church. So what what can that tell us about you know the church facing persecution, the gospel being spread anyway? What can that tell us about how we live our lives now as followers of Jesus? I think it can teach us that like the persecution, we may not have the same persecution they did, mm-hmm. right? but our lives are filled with, as you said, trials. So I may have a family member in recovery or who's struggling, and I may not have ever wanted to go down that path to figure all that out or run into the people that I'm with now, but God worked, 
I can choose. I mean, it's really my choice. I can engage with this new place that I'm in now mm-hmm. and carry that mission into this new place, or I can choose not to. Mm. Um, so I think it doesn't have to be um, persecution. I think it can be anything that takes us out of sure. our what's comfortable or what we know or a path we would have chosen for ourselves that we now find ourselves in. Um, and we can live in mission on mission there. Yeah. Like when you think about the great commission, right? Well-known passage, um, therefore go into all the world. The, the phrase there is like, as you go, it's like that as you're going into the world. So it's, there is both an intentional, like I need to be on mission right and to choose to go yes but there's also an aspect of in my going that is a part of god's mission in the world Mm -hmm. so the relationships that kind of unfold in my life or that come to me you know or that happen to me are also to be seen through the through the lens of of god's movement in the world and um i imagine that's part of what turned the ancient world upside down with the early church is that they saw their lives as a part of the mission and movement yes of god in whatever town they were in you yeah know? and when you were talking about um like as a what was that quote you're going to use the, oh, it's, the army yeah um, um it's it's sometimes hard to turn a family into an army but people who were in the army together often become family right and in the in the early church I'll call it the late early church. So after the Bible, <laughs> the late but still church. the early church. Yeah. Um, that's what people noticed. And so remember how we talked about in the last podcast, how everybody in the new family of God was equal. And so they would see these people treating each other as brothers and sisters. They were the army, I guess, you know, they mm-hmm. were able to be a family together and that c- carrying the mission of God into the world. And that got people's attention. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily a program. They right. were just living their lives. Just living their lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. But they allowed their lives to be turned upside down by the reality of the gospel. You think about yeah. the wealthy yeah. opening up their homes, right. building in places for, for um, foreigners and travelers, um, people, families adopting babies that were left out for exposure. Yeah. yeah. Um, Which was a common Roman practice, right? Right. Yeah. You know, to, to let a child die that was... Um, had a deformity or was unwanted or was born female and And people noticed that like that in fact some people were able to go into homes after that because oftentimes the moms weren't the ones that wanted to have the babies killed right and so when they knew that their child had been rescued it offered a a path for the christians to be able to yeah wow you know preach the gospel there well Tell them about it, Jesus. Yeah, and, and the fact that there were, like we talked about in the last podcast, that there was people at every social class living together in community, um, which is, it, that, that didn't always go well. You know, there were plenty of times where there was conflict um, that we get letters in our New Testament written into to correct, mm-hmm. because that was hard. It was so countercultural. But this was a sign to the world yeah. that this community that we talked about last time was a movement that was turning the world upside down. They were living into the new creation that we'll talk about. In the next episode, it was it was being born in the church as they were on movement and, and on mission together in the world. And I, it, I just find it so I didn't I interrupted no, you. No, go. I just find it so interesting how they really just went into social places and lived out their faith. They they like one of the places that they did was they had um I think it was in the Roman culture where they had uh, if you wanted to be buried in a certain place, you had to be part of a club that you paid your dues mm-hmm. to be in the club, Whoa. and you had to like. And then if you paid enough dues, then you were able to get buried in this special place or whatever. But right. if you didn't pay your dues, you were out, and you didn't have a place to be buried. And so it was like a big deal if you lost your fortune or you, you know, because like we're. Cow. But with the Christian community, they were sharing all of that, and they were making sure people had that proper burial something that seems so like we don't even think about that today because we yeah. have the ability to bury our dead right. um and but for them that was like another they just spoke into what was happening in their culture in that time yeah. and living it out yeah. in community they were yeah. that was part of the movement i don't i do you think that sometimes they didn't even realize 
that as we look at it today, we see that as part of the movement, and they just saw that as part of this is how we live as Christians. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, there were things, I imagine the things that were countercultural and that were counter however they were raised, there must have been some intentionality there. But in people's discipleship to Jesus, at some point that just starts to flow out of this new worldview that you've adopted and that the Holy Spirit is working in you. And um, something that Kim and I have talked about before and that she noticed um, in other places was that there were unique values in ways that the church lived out mission. For example, like patience Mm -hmm. was a part of it, which you wouldn't think patience works with movement sure right don't yeah. those sound like yeah. they're not supposed to work together well, wasn't there there's a passage i'm sorry i cut you out there's a passage where um paul the apostle paul is going and doing his thing yeah and the holy spirit he's he's moving along mm-hmm. going into asia, asia i believe and yeah. the holy spirit says actually no yeah. don't and he doesn't and it, it just speaks into that that patience right and so there's this like holding together we are compelled by the spirit to move into a dark world, mm-hmm. you know, and bring bring order to chaos and bring light into darkness. And we cannot get ahead of what of the Holy Spirit. It yeah. is not on us to move God's mission forward. Yeah. Right. And so how do you see those held together? Well, in the the late early church, <laughs> I don't know what else to call it. Yeah. In the hundreds, um, they Patients, they believed that that was so crucial and um, to the, their their walk with Jesus, their formation, that God would take care of the rest. Mm-hmm. Like if they were patient in how they interacted with people. So if some guy at the market makes them mad and they just, you know, continue to love that person and respond politely or whatever, people notice. People, you know, they just, it was just, they trusted God for the fruit. They trusted God they were patient in they didn't they didn't have programs in the sense of evangelism like we've seen in the past mm-hmm. right um the recent past um they trusted god would bring the people it was like our western minds don't even yeah we can't even well, grasp that <laughs> we, we love a quick fix right and, right. If, yeah. and i right. i think we have this false notion that if it if we get results quickly that's the Best that that's thing. good. Yeah, that that's a good thing. And that's not, yeah, it's not always but by the case. Being, and by being patient, that doesn't mean they weren't doing anything. Right? Correct. They were just trusting God would be the one, God would move. They continued to live faithfully. That, that's why, like, um, uh, I'm going to say the word wrong catechism, cata, catechism, 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 catechesis. catechesis. Like the yeah. training of disciples was so crucial. Like mm. that was, they, they were, that was. They didn't even let p- other people into the worship service until they had gone through a certain level of training because it was so important for them to know what was what what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. Yeah. Like you don't get to do all right. you don't because back then that culture was prayer was seen as like magical or you know and they didn't want people coming into the church just to access prayer for the magic properties or whatever you know that they Mm -hmm. had in mind so it was they took discipleship very seriously because in the living it out that's what people noticed so worship all the times of worship was formational um all of that and and the people on the outside didn't necessarily see what was happening there all they could see was the life Mm -hmm. how people were living right and that was what and then that's that's where the disciples were patient about mm-hmm. how God was going to work using their lives. And, and so there's so, this, yeah, so there's this like <laughs> deep patience in living out um, life where you are. And there were people, you know, think about the Apostle Paul, who were going and selling themselves and letting themselves be imprisoned and announcing the gospel in places it had never been before, mm-hmm. right? And so there's this... Um, like this rest in the Holy Spirit and this ambition, mm-hmm. this like drive um, to bring the gospel to the, to the furthest and the farthest yeah. away. And those, those are both a part of the, of the movement of the, of the church. Yeah. It's uh, ambition is such an interesting 
subject for me, oh, uh, especially as a uh, you know thirty something year old guy. A lot of people will tell you that ambition is a bad thing because it leads to to pride or um, prioritizing things incorrectly or or whatever. But ambition in the context of being led by the Holy Spirit of being on mission with God. Right. Is a yes. it's a completely different thing. And it kind of goes back to what we were saying before about being in lockstep with where God is calling us and what yeah. God is doing. Because once am, ambition reaches beyond that, that's when you get into trouble oh, and yeah. you try to move ahead yeah. of what of what God is doing. Yeah. At least that's been my experience. <laughs> yeah, you gotta think like Jesus wanted something, so he left heaven. Right, right. They, he was. He was. There, there is a a time to wait, and there's a time to move. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, and the discernment of that is so difficult. Yeah. Um, because I usually find that it's uh, often pushing on whatever my natural inclination is. Right. <laughs> well, and it's <laughs> no know? wonder, as you know, we've been having this conversation that patience is one of the fruits of the spirit. Mm-hmm. Like these people had to. I mean, one, it's counter human nature and two it was countercultural to be patient so it required full reliance on the holy spirit in order to live out this patient way of of living yep mm-hmm. yep yep and they were in in that living it out they were still able to share their story um they were still able to talk about jesus it wasn't like they didn't just you know sit back and be patient god i'm waiting yeah. for you to do something yeah. you which know? i guess think is about that's peter praying on the roof and the Holy Spirit interrupts his prayer time, you know, or maybe hijacks his prayer time to send him on mission, mm-hmm. right? And to let him know that that there's a, a messenger coming from a Gentile, and you're supposed to go to his house and share the gospel because the things um, that you think are unclean, they're they're not, mm-hmm. right? You know anymore, and uh, and so are we putting ourselves in a position to let the Holy Spirit? highlight to us who needs to know about this God that loves them, where is their brokenness that we are called to move towards and bring wholeness. Um, you know, and it took Peter, how many times did the four, three, four, I don't know. <laughs> I don't it took a few the, the, the sheet to go up and down. I think it was three or four. It's always yeah. nice to see that like, you know, Peter's formation was um, uh, as slow as mine. <laughs> how many times does he argue with jesus when he's with jesus you know yeah. and god's like okay let's go over this again and uh and then at this moment yeah. it's the same it's the same peter he has that vision he goes and one more time one more time <laughs> surely not, not lord yeah right i mean doesn't he it's almost verbatim what he says to jesus yeah. um you know and and uh this shall never be right when jesus talks about being crucified and then yeah. when the holy spirit's trying to tell him Arise, kill, and eat. He's like, no. <laughs> Wait, what? No. <laughs> Trick yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, you had mentioned how um, it's important us to, for us to be able to hear God's voice, hear um, where we feel like the Spirit is leading us. Um, what are some ways that help us to do that? Um, what are some practices that we can participate in as followers of Jesus that help us open up to God's voice and help hear God's help us hear God's voice? I would say being well, being in His Word regularly, and then silence and solitude. You yeah. know, moments, times when you're in silence um, help with that. But again, community at some point needs to be a part of that mm-hmm. because otherwise, you could be imagining all kinds of things that. May not be well because the that's Holy where Spirit. like discernment comes in, mm-hmm. e- even like words of encouragement and, and affirmation and mm-hmm. prophecy. Like that's super important, and you completely miss that if you're if you're outside a community. Mm-hmm. Yes, and another aspect of community is there's people that are um, wired by the gift of the Holy Spirit differently than I am, and so I may be in of myself a little more prone towards. Maybe the church's community side of things. Maybe I'm very pastoral and I'm and I'm gentle and I'm um, about loving people deeply and and that's beautiful. But it is important for me to be with in community with folks that are pioneers 
and that want to go to the margins and that see the the people that have the least and and need healing and for them to push on each other mm-hmm. you know they need each other's voices in their life but often church's movement one of the things that we'll see is however god has wired me that's what i will say is holy mm-hmm. and however god has wired you i will say is annoying <laughs> and, <laughs> right you don't get the thing that i get and often we will break community over things that should be lived out together Mm -hmm. wow you know yeah and um the pioneers the you know the people like paul and peter and um, priscilla who paul sends to preach the book of romans um to the church there i mean like these are people that are always pulling you know which is beautiful and they need the folks that are more rooted and are more um prone to living out life together deeply and and vice versa yeah you know those folks have to have each other Mm -hmm. so looking at paul and his ministry you know you mentioned earlier how he he went out and uh and was spreading the gospel and when you know at the beginning of of paul's ministry he he pairs up um oh my gosh with barnabas barnabas and mark Yeah, John Mark for John a little Mark. bit until John Mark makes him mad. But that's a whole yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a go read. Act. Is that where you're going? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, just I guess what where I'm what I'm getting at is what can that tell us? You know, as we're talking about church as a movement, like what does that tell us today about how we can go um, and spread the gospel and the importance of having others with us in doing that. Like, is there anything for us to glean from the way that Paul did it? Mm. I think some things that I noticed. Well, one, Barnabas, that's not his name. He gets named that, Mm -hmm. um, and it means son of encouragement, right? And so you have this encourager that's together with Paul, who's a bit of a, he's a bit of a tough cookie, you know, to be like. um, Well, based on his former life, yeah, I can see that. (laughs) Having a Barnabas with him was probably a good idea. Probably a good thing. Which is funny. I mean, just What Paul really means is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for sure and things get hard and mark deserts them and then comes back and paul's like i'm not taking that guy anywhere and the son of encouragement barnabas is like no we should have him with us they end up splitting ways right mm-hmm. and the gospel is furthered because you now you have two groups of church planners i'm sure that was not god's will but god will use whatever happens to further his mission and then it's mm-hmm. just worth saying that at the end of second timothy when Paul is at the end of his life and he's preparing to die, he says, and send Mark to me because he's dear to me mm-hmm. and have mm-hmm. him bring my letters. So, so here you have Mark restored at some point with the Apostle Paul. And he's bringing the New Testament. He's bringing the, the first fragments of the New Testament to, to see Paul again. Wow. You know, yeah, and uh, and so even as this church and community gets fractured because they can't figure out how to do churches movement together, it at some point the spirit of God brings things back back together. Maybe decades later, mm. you know, and there's and there's healing as the mission is furthered. Sorry, that's a whole sermon, yeah. and I'm on a dog leg. Um, but how did Paul? do things together yeah one of the things is when he would when he would go to a place and plant a church he would build the church they would start to to live out the community side of things together and these churches always start different sometimes he preaches in the synagogue and there's a few people saved and he goes from there sometimes like in athens he preaches at the Areopagus at mars hill and you know and it starts with the gentiles Sometimes, like in Ephesus, there's a riot that breaks out yeah. and it turns into a church plant. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, mark. but the next move is to is to build the community that can sustain the movement. Yeah, and he would find those people that were already open, yeah, um, and and start with them as well. And he was a tent maker, so he mm-hmm. would kind he just kind of like made himself part of the community that was there, the context he was in. Yes, he got to know what was expected there and he just worked with 
what I, what he had mm-hmm. um, and how God equipped him. So it was pretty cool how he did that um, and stayed with people. And, mm-hmm. and, yeah. and there's pictures of them in the book of Acts, like weeping, saying goodbye to each other, you know, on the shore. So this was more than just a project that he was working on to make himself feel better, right? Mm-hmm. He was giving his heart to people. Yeah. And I think on in movement, church's movement, it can't turn into achieving for the Lord. Right. It has to it has to remain an act of love. Yeah. You know, for people. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, that's hard to hard to sustain. It yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think too, when I when I look at you know Paul and Barnabas and the importance of going out together, um, again talking about community, it just it's it just shows again how important it is as as we're trying to follow Jesus and as we're trying to spread the good news of the gospel that it's so much easier is the word i'm going to use but it's it's easier in the sense that we have someone to help um bear our burdens with someone to encourage yeah. us that the holy spirit is also living in right, right. yeah and yeah. and i guess i see this the most in like in my life currently is in bands right where you're you're sharing your spiritual life so, so with somebody else what a discipleship band is for oh, people yeah. that aren't so you know it, they're like the beatles the what? Be- yeah so a discipleship <laughs> band is is an opportunity for it's usually about three or four people um to share their spiritual lives with one another um and it it sounds so simple but and i think i'm going to pronounce this word correctly the profundity of the things that come out um in that was nice thank profundity. you profundity that was good. yeah i heard it in another podcast once so there we go that's Maybe. better than profoundness Pro- yeah, well, so little, that's where i was gonna go quicker. i was like i'm pretty sure profundity is a word so here we go <laughs> um but it's so has been for me just incredibly life giving and god honoring and um again talking about bearing bearing burdens like life is hard and having other guys with me who are helping me in that is just i i don't know where i'd be yeah and a part of that being in community with each other is helping each other discern what god's mission is in my life at this moment what does it look like yes Mm -hmm. because the holy spirit's always on mission yeah right if we're not living on mission then we're not following the holy spirit the question is what does it look like today or in this season of my life Mm -hmm. and that that's where something like a discipleship band is helpful where people can help one another Mm -hmm. discern yeah when we even look back at at jesus with his disciples he sent them out two by two he didn't send them out one at a time right um so we do need other people with us when we're on mission yeah good point colin just (laughs) observation i made (laughs) um so as we look at church as a movement and we've kind of been looking at the early church as we stand today as the church and we can look at this as the big c church or just here locally Mm -hmm. at Lacroix church what is and this could be a whole two-hour conversation too but what are some things that we can do as a church as members of a church to help move the gospel forward in our community and even even beyond well, one of the things that i would say is don't don't see being on mission or being a part of the movement as optional mm. um that is that is central to our to our relationship with jesus and um and so can you say this is how god has me on mission right now because you've because you've sought him now we're always open like think about philip and the ethiopian yeah right i love yeah. that story yeah. isn't that so great yeah the, he ends up um going down to damascus right which is not nearby uh jerusalem and they're on the road and the ethiopian comes up and he hears the spirit speak to him and say go up to the chariot so there's a there's an a walking openness to the spirit he comes up he hears the ethiopian uh reading who's probably in town for the passover yeah and he hears him reading isaiah and is confused (laughs) imagine that (laughs) (laughs) pretty easy to do philip asks if he can hop up goes on um on the ride with him and and shares 
the good news of Jesus. This Ethiopian is baptized and sent back to Ethiopia. And the oldest churches in the world today are in Ethiopia. Yeah. Wow. The oldest churches in the world today are in Ethiopia. And they trace the gospel coming to them back to that man. Yep. Which is all kinds of fun. That is super right? cool. Mm-hmm. And so is there, I guess all that to say, there's this as you go openness. But I think it is also helpful for disciples of Jesus to be able to say, this is the season of life that I am in now, and this is how I am. I have heard God ask me to live out his movement and mission mm. in this stage of my life, and that helps in, in community. So can, can you do that? If you can't, pray about it. Ask some people, God, what, where do you have me right now? What do you want me to do? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kim, any thoughts on that? Well, I was just thinking... How do you, like, if you're somebody who doesn't, who hasn't done that before or hasn't mm. figured out how to, like, wh- how, how, how do I, what is on mission look like? What is, like, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to mm-hmm. do? Like, you know, what would you tell people? Yeah, uh, that's a good, I might start with, um, like, a mix of what are my relationships that I have? What are the things that I, what are the spaces that I am engaged in? What are the passions? What are the things that I'm drawn towards? What catches my attention? Um, And maybe, maybe start with those things and say, God, what do you want me to do in the spaces that I already am? Which is kind of where we started when we talked about the church being on mission in the space that they were. Um, And then be open to what God might, might say. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, we have the bless journals right now. Um, I think that's maybe a good way to, uh, sorry, I'm bringing that in. Um, But (laughs) that's perfect. I mean, that was, we put that together because we knew that the folks in our church um, needed help growing in that area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so maybe pick one of the bless journals up, um, begin with prayer, listen to people, eat with people, serve them, and share your story. And, uh, And that would be maybe a great place to start walking out being on mission. Yeah. I think we have to remember the relationship part of it too. Yeah. And then the thing that sometimes trips people up or it has tripped me up for is just the fear factor. Like what if people, what if they don't, what if they reject me or what if mm. I say something wrong that actually makes somebody go the opposite direction um, of Jesus. And I think I have to remember that I have the ha- same Holy spirit living in me that lived in these disciples on the day of Pentecost and yeah. that he's going to help me and give me the power to, to live this out. Yeah. Um, so sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the, I might do something wrong and right. to kind of relax from that and just let the Holy Spirit kind of take a page out of the early church book of being patient, like let God do the work. You yes. keep being faithful with what you know mm-hmm. and how God's working in your life. Yeah. And let him do the work in their lives. Right. So. Something that had come up in my mind somewhat recently is I heard someone with good intention saying, I need to be bold about my faith or something like that, which I think I knew what they were meaning to say. Mm-hmm. But it was just, uh, it came to me that there are people that when they feel like they need to be bold about something, that's really about managing our own anxiousness to be doing what we're supposed to yeah. be doing. Yeah. And it comes across as, uh, I don't know, a little harsh or a little projecty or a little like, oh, this is about you, isn't it? Mm. This is about you. And so the phrase that came to my mind is, I want, I want that to come out of a peaceful boldness. Like, I'm not bold because I feel like I have to, have to, have to. I can be bold because I'm at peace. Yeah. Like, I'm not trying... I'm not trying to manage the situation. Yeah. I'm at peace, so I can I can share my faith openly. It's at least in my mind, it's more about confidence and, yes. and where you're putting your trust. Because right. if you're putting your trust in yourself, right. hey, I need to be bold about this thing. Right. Well, then it's not <laughs> it's not probably going to go very well. Yeah. But if but if you trust and believe that God was the one that put that in mm-hmm. your heart, it's probably going to go a lot better. Yeah. for you um, mm-hmm. in the long run. I have a question. Can I ask questions too? Sure, of course. <laughs> yeah. So how do you distinguish the difference or is there a difference between being on mission and missions? 
You know what I'm saying? What I'm asking? Like yeah. we, so we have missions. Like we're about to send a team, commission a team to go to East Watini on right. what we call a mission trip. So how is that different than being on mission? Or there is there any difference in that? Oh man, and I think you'd probably be better to answer that than. Well, I'm just wondering. If you, I, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's where maybe a bit of our modern language um, isn't wrong, but it gets in our way a little bit. Mm-hmm. Is we have missionaries, which is a great thing. They're people that have left their context, you know, to go um, bring the word of God and the work of God to another place that needs it. And then we have mission trips, like we have students that are going on a local mission trip. We have a team that's um, going, wh- what country are they headed to? The, um, the, the trip coming up soon? Yes. East Watini. East Watini. Um, and we, you know, mission trips are, that is a clear picture of we are going on mission. I think the downside is just that then, then it gets bracketed off mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as that's what it is. You know, it's over, it's over there. And, um, you know, mission, that's a a Latin word, you know, like missile, right? It means to be sent, right? And we are constantly being sent by ascending God. Mm -hmm. And to remember that, the the Greek word is apostle, you know, apostolos um, means to be sent. That's the Latin version of that word is is missio, Mm -hmm. um, is missionary. And so... Maybe as people who, maybe we should prefer Greek to Latin because the New Testament's written in, in Greek. In Greek. Maybe we should be a little more okay with, um, this is this is me being an apostle mm-hmm. sent sent by Jesus, you know, into my into my world. And so, in a way, they're they're similar too, because in both yeah. we are joining God. Yes, and what he's doing. In what he's doing, whether it's with my neighbor across the street or whether it's with somebody in East Watini right. and they with me. Sometimes right. it's, you know, if, especially if we're interacting with other Christians in a different context. Yes. Um, there is also, I'm, I'm also being transformed by what God is doing in their lives right. as I interact with them. So, And in a way, I guess maybe just to kind of pull it back around to put a bow on it, is this is, this is the church living out the mission that God has always had in mind. Right. Yeah. Um, from creation, how he's restoring yeah. in the fall, the mission that he wanted Israel to be on that often that they refused, the mission that Jesus was on, this is the church continuing to live out the mission that God has always been on and will be on until he takes us to the new creation where it just continues into eternity in a mm. new way. Beautiful. Any final thoughts? Mm, I don't... Mm. Mm. You go first. Do you have any <laughs> final thoughts? No, I think those, those were mine. Sweet. You know, is that this is... Um, this church as community, church as movement, um, this is, uh, it's not a new thing. It's, uh, it's God pulling us into his thing that has always been happening and will always continue into the future. Awesome. All right. Well, um, as you said, next week, we're going to be looking at the new creation, yeah. which is going to be a fun conversation. Um, Thank you, Kim, for being here with us uh, as we've been talking about the church. Brett, as always, thank you. Um, And thank you all for joining us. And uh, we'll see you on the next one.